good to see everybody in this afternoon, and uh, we've got more than a full house. Won't be long. They're going to have to give us a build bigger studio, aren't they? And uh, we've got folks here from uh, Indiana, Illinois, and uh, various parts of Oklahoma. Now, did I miss any other out of state? Oh, yeah, Texas. Good grief. Yes, right here in front of me. So anyway, uh, we just want all of you to feel welcome and uh, how much we appreciate your coming in and being a part of this. And, uh, you know, I think some of our visitors from Chicago were just anxious to get here and start meeting the people that they've been seeing on television over the years. Have you been meeting a few of them? Yeah. And uh, so it is. It, it's just a good time afternoon. And uh, plus that we're blessed with the feeding of the Word of God, we trust. Okay, for all of those of you out in television, again, we just have to thank you. When the letters come in, oh, every letter comes in, I wish I could answer it, I wish I could answer it. Well, I'd never get anything else done, of course, so you have to just let me get by with this on television to just express my personal appreciation for all of your good letters. My, what a shot in the arm it is every day. And uh, to hear the response from, uh, from the program, and so many coming to a knowledge of salvation for the first time. We, we just can't praise the Lord enough. Okay, now we're going to start a new book today, book 69, and uh, I'm going to depart from the but nows and but gods, and we're going to take a, a look at one of the themes of Scripture. We're going to chase it all the way down from Genesis to Revelation, and it's this whole idea of redemption. And uh, Jerry's got the three various word forms. We've got the word redeemed, and we've got we, the, the verb tense, to redeem, and then the noun is redemption. And, of course, they're all associated with the same act of God, which is, by definition, buying back something that was originally owned and lost. That's the whole idea of redemption, and I always use the simplest illustration in our Western culture of a hawk shop. And uh, I've never, fortunately, had to hawk something, but I have bought things in a hawk shop because you can get some pretty good deals, you know. But the whole idea of a hawk shop is that if you get in a financial bind, you can take something that may be rather intrinsically precious to you and uh, get a small amount of money for it. And then hopefully down the road, you can go back and redeem it by buying it back. And hopefully in a hawk shop, it'll still be there. So the whole idea of redemption is that you have owned something, it's been secure, but it was lost, and it will have to be redeemed in order to regain ownership. All right, now, God has had to do this over and over, and we're going to look at the various places where he had to come back in and redeem that which was originally his own. And, of course, the first place to start would be Adam. So you can turn with me, if you will, to Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 1, and uh, I'm just going to drop right in at the verse of creation, verse 27 and 28 of Genesis 1. All got it? Verse 27, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, the first thing I always have to qualify, in fact, I just shared it with somebody on the phone in the last day or two, that when God created man in his image, it was not our physical appearance as man or woman because God was an invisible creature, but he was a personality. And personality is an invisible entity. And uh, way back when we taught this, I, I made the illustration. You could go into an autopsy, and as they are taking everything apart bit by bit, they can dissect the brain into the smallest particles, but they'll never find the personality. Well, does that mean the personality isn't real? Of course it's real. And God was made up of personality, the mind, the will, and the emotion. And all three persons of the Godhead, you can chase through Scripture, are given credit with those same things. God the Son had mind, will, emotion. God the Father has mind, will, emotion. So does the Holy Spirit. All right, so when he created mankind then in his image, it was that part of the Godhead that was transferred, you might say, to humankind. Adam was created as an invisible mind, will, and emotion, but 
since he's going to function as mankind functions, God placed him into what we call the body. Now, it's just that simple. So the body is a temporary thing. That's why Paul calls it in 2 Corinthians 5 a tabernacle, a tent. Now, a tent is always temporary. So our real person, your real you, has been placed into a temporary tent-like thing, which we call the body. And so when people call and say, well, what happens at death? Well, always remember the invisible part of us that was created in the image of God will never die. Don't you ever fall for this idea of soul sleep. It cannot die because it was created in an, e in an eternal entity. And it's going to live eternally someplace. The lost are going to spend their eternity doomed in the lake of fire. The saved are going to spend eternity in God's presence. But both are going to be eternal because we are an eternal created being. The body was temporary. And that's why we can lay the body in the grave and it goes back to the dust. But never the person. Never the mind, will, and emotion. All right, so now then, this is where we can move on. God creates Adam as a person, but he calls up out of the dust of the earth the tabernacle in which he's going to dwell. And so verse 27, he created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Now that's the invisible part. God didn't have a visible body at this point in time. All right, now then verse 28, and God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowls of the air, over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Now, what is the general mentality of mankind when they think of Adam and Eve being placed in the garden? How much authority, how much dominion did they have? Well, wherever the garden was limited. That's what most people, I'm sure, think was their responsibility, the Garden of Eden. No, the whole planet was their responsibility. There was no ocean in the Garden of Eden. You see that? But that's what he's got dominion over, the fish of the sea. And the same way with all the other animals that weren't part and parcel of the garden itself. So never lose sight of the fact that Adam was given dominion over the whole planet. Now, the reason I'm emphasizing this as we come through these various portions of Scripture dealing with uh, redemption, I'll tell you what got me started on it. My daughter had said long time ago, she said, Daddy, I hope someday you'll do a study on the book of Ruth. Well, I've been putting it aside, and once in a while I delve into it, and I think, well, someday out in the future. Well, when I got ready for this taping, that's where I started. I was going to teach the book of Ruth. And I just ran up a cement wall because as I was going to teach redemption in the little book of Ruth, there was no mention of the blood. There was no mention of death. And I thought, oh, wait a minute, I, I can't teach just this alone by itself. And so as I was getting ready over the last several months now, this just wasn't in the last week, I was tying this in with Revelation chapter 5. Because whenever I teach Revelation chapter 5 and they bring God the Son, brings the, the mortgage that we speak of it before God the Father, the only way we can connect anything to that is from the book of Ruth. But when I got ready to teach the book of Ruth, that wasn't the real picture of the other forms of redemption which always involve a blood sacrifice and so forth. So I had to rethink the whole thing and decided, well, I'm going to, in fact, if I got room on the board, I'm going to put it on the board so that uh, everybody can uh, always remember better what, what you see than what you hear. We're going to find that we're going to have redemption in four, in four places. Number one, we're going to see Adam lost and restored. The next we're going to see is the nation of Israel, lost and restored. Then we're going to see at the cross that the whole human race, humanity, I guess I can put it, the whole sphere of humanity is going to be in a place of redemption. 
And then the fourth one we're going to cover is the redemption of the planet, the physical, Earth. Now, maybe that'll help. So we're going to start back here. Now, the only way that I could fit the Book of Ruth in here is to put it someplace in here, halfway up to the Old Testament, the Book of Ruth. But I'm going to have to bypass it because it will not have any connection to these until I get down to this one. So if you can bear with me, that's the whole scope of my afternoon or maybe the next two afternoons. I, don't, I never know how far we'll get. See, I may run out of gas at the end of the third program and I'll have to hurry up and figure out something else. But I don't think so. I think I'm going to have enough material here to hold us all afternoon. Okay, so back to Genesis now then. Adam is given dominion over everything. Not just that little area of the Garden of Eden, but the whole planet is now under his dominion. All right, now let's just jump for sake of time on up to uh, chapter 2, verse 16. Now we jump up to where things really are going to start taking off. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat. For in the day thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now that's plain English, isn't it? Now verse 18. Now the Lord God said, It's not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helpmeet for him. So out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field, the fowls of the air, brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name. Verse 20, Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the fowl, to the beast. But for Adam, there was not found a helpmeet. Now here again, that's another I could go all afternoon on that alone. Because most people think that when I read chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, Adam and Eve were both created side by side. No, they weren't. Adam was alone for the longest time, although Eve was in Adam. And oh, that turns people off. They, they just can't handle that, so I'm not going to deal with it this afternoon. But anyway, sometime later, after all the animals have been named, and they've all been coming, no doubt, like at the ark, two by two, it was the first thing Adam notices. Every female has its male, and he has none. He's alone. And so God saw in the heart of Adam that he was longing for a mate. And so that's why he comes back then in uh, verse 21, 22, and he creates Eve to be a helpmeet for Adam. Now, that's long after he was originally created, see? But anyway... Now you come down to verse 23 and 24, and Adam said, This is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Now let me stop and ask a minute. How much mind, will, and emotion is in a rib bone? <laughs> Have you ever thought of that? See, this is what I tell my callers. The phone, you know, I'm on the phone some days, almost from morning till night. And the first thing I tell people, think. Just sit back and think. This isn't so deep. Now somebody, I think it was Ike, you gave me that book on quantum physics, didn't you? I don't know where in the world he thought I had the wherewithal. But he gives me a book on quantum physics and come to find out that in the last six or eight months they have now found mathematically that there are 10 or 11 dimensions instead of three. But see, that's beyond me and it's beyond most people, but this book isn't. This book is not beyond the thinking realm of the simplest of the simple. And you know, I'm always using the illustration. I, I see it when we're dubbing tapes. I've used it over and over. When old Tyndale, the reformer, was trying to get Bibles across the channel into England, and they finally caught him, and they were going to burn him at the stake for it. What was his final plea to God? Oh, let every plowboy in England have a copy of this book. Well, then here's my point. How much education did a plowboy in England have in 1500? Well, not much. 
But was it enough to understand Scripture? Yes. See, so don't ever tell or let somebody tell you, well, it, it's too complicated. I can't. No, it isn't. God has made it so simple that a plowboy in England in 1500 could read it and comprehend it. See? Okay, so now then, we have to understand that when Adam was first formed, Eve was within him, and God takes her out at this point in time, and Adam doesn't call her Eve, he calls her woman. And so she's only called woman all the rest of the verses until we get to chapter 3 in verse 20. All right, but I want, don't want to uh, jump away from chapter 2 just yet. Come back there, where he says, She's now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Now verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. They were both naked. They were totally in complete oblivious to sin or anything like that. They were perfectly innocent. And uh, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Okay, now when you get into chapter 3, we have the fall. They eat of the tree, and now God loses them. That's the point I want to make. Here they've been in the very will of God. The Lord comes down every day and walks with them, communes with them. I think person to person, they communicated, and it was the most glorious relationship that you could ever hope for. But then all of a sudden, Satan moves in, and Adam ate, and Eve ate, and they lost that favored position. They were now separated from their Creator. Now get the picture. They were God's. He made them. They were His. But He left them with the option of being obedient or disobedient. And when they became disobedient, He lost them. Now, in order to show you how clearly he lost them, uh, drop down to verse 8 of chapter 3. And don't forget, the Lord has been communicating with them every day. Oh, what a time of fellowship that must have been, walking in the midst of that beautiful garden with the Lord at their side. But now in verse 8, they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife ran to meet him. Is that what your Bible says? <laughs> no, quite the opposite. Now what do they do? They run and hide. Their fellowship has been broken. See? Sin has entered. And God's lost them. But now I'm always emphasizing the Apostle Paul's use of the word grace. But listen, grace didn't originate with Paul. Grace originated right here. Because when they ran to hide and rather than confront the glorious creator God, does God just simply give up on them? No. He seeks them out. Well, why? His grace. That's the grace of God in its first example. See? Okay, reading on. And so they heard the voice of the Lord walk in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord and among the trees of the garden. And now verse 9. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said, Where art thou? Now, when I taught this 15 years ago on television, I made the point. Didn't God know where they were? Of course he did. So why does he call? The same way he calls today. He wants a free will response. He wasn't going to circle them out and say, Oh, there you are. Uh-uh. But he calls, Where are you? And he's waiting for their response. Nothing has changed. Okay, now read on. Verse 10. And Adam said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And the Lord said, Who told you that you were naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee thou shouldst not eat? And the man said, The woman <laughs> hasn't changed a bit, has it? Has it, honey? <laughs> it's always the woman's fault, see? The woman whom thou hast given me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Well, anyway, what we have to understand now is that I'm going to skip over 14 and 15 for just a moment and come back to it later. 
Here we find that in verse 17, as a result of the fall, God lost that glorious fellowship between himself and his created beings. And they're going to suffer the results of it with, verse 17 now, because thou hast hearkened to the voice of thy wife, you've eaten of the tree which I command thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth thee. Thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return to the ground. For out of it wast thou taken. Dust thou art, to dust thou shalt return." All right, that was the lot now of fallen Adam and Eve out of fellowship with their creator. Now, what's God going to have to do? He's going to have to redeem them. He's going to have to pay the price of redemption to bring Adam and Eve back into a walk and a talk with himself. All right, now verse 20 comes the first step back from separation to once again enjoying fellowship with the creator. And Adam called his name, wife's name, Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Now, if you know your Bible, ever since chapter 1, when Eve appeared, she was called nothing but woman. The woman said, the woman this, the woman that. And here is the first instance now where we have her called Eve, because she was to be the mother of all living. Now, here's the big question. Adam understood that when they ate, death was imminent. Well, how are you going to be the mother of all living if you're going to die? So here's my question. On what basis does Adam call the woman, Eve, the mother of all living? Faith. I heard it. Faith. And what's faith? Taking God at his word. Now by deduction. Just like algebra, you deduct. What had God evidently told them? That they weren't going to die right away. They're going to propagate their own likenesses. And so consequently, believing God, although it may have seemed as utterly ridiculous as a lot of things that we have to take by faith, Adam believed him and called her then the mother of all living. And I'm sure he had no idea of what that was going to entail. But in simple faith, he said, all right, I'll call her Eve because that's what she's going to be. All right, now then we have the faith established, which is one of the two absolutes. The second absolute, if we had time to go back and look at it, is blood. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. All right, so we've got the faith established. So now where comes the blood? And always remember, blood is the price of redemption. And that's why I'm using this one. All right, right down into verse 21. And to Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats or clothing of skins, animal skins. Now again, you've got to sit back and think. What's God doing? Well, he's preparing an animal sacrifice, but he's going to use, what's the word I'm looking for? He's going to kill two birds with one stone. He's not only going to clothe their physical nakedness with these animals, he's also going to have the blood for the blood sacrifice. And so these animals were killed. And I made a point in one of my seminars in Minnesota. Don't ever think God was cruel because even the Jewish priests and so forth were so adept at killing those sacrificial animals. They never suffered, not for a second. It was instant death, painless death. And that's what we have to feel that God did here. He killed these animals and used the skins to provide clothing for Adam and Eve. But more important, it was the blood that was needed for a restoration and for a forgiveness, for an atonement. All right, so now then we find this is so clearly put that he made coats of skins to clothe their nakedness. And then the next word is clothed, which is a spiritual term. And the only way we can put that together is jump all the way up to Isaiah. Now we'll have to do this quickly because, again, time is getting away from us, isn't it? All the way up to Isaiah 61. Verse 10. Now this is clear up to Isaiah. 
only 700 B.C. instead of 4,000. And look at Isaiah experiences. The same thing, the same forgiveness, the same blood application. Isaiah 61, verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he, God, has, watch the word, clothed. The same word in Genesis. For he hath clothed me, not with the garments for the physical flesh, but garments of what? Salvation. See the difference? For he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments. Now, we got one minute. You got to jump all the way up to Romans. And you know what? It's no different. Paul now teaches basically the same thing in Romans chapter 3. And this is where you and I have come. The same forgiveness. We've got, of course, the toning blood of Christ instead of an animal. But all oh, the result is the same. Romans chapter 3, verse 22. Romans chapter 3, verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by the faith of Jesus Christ unto all, and upon all them that, what? Believe. Now, what is imputed to the believer? The clothing of righteousness. The covering of righteousness. When we become a believer, I maintain God doesn't see me. He doesn't see you. God sees who? Jesus Christ. We've been clothed with his righteousness. Now that's beyond human comprehension, but it's what the book says. When Adam and Eve came away from that experience of being clothed with their physical nakedness, they also were clothed with God's righteousness. It restored them back to fellowship with the Creator. You see all that? He bought them back from their lost estate. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick.